We have television content and delivery, new forms of viewing. Our lead speaker is right here, my dear friend, Quan Fung, who is the head of television at Bluegrass Pictures. Um, it's a TV and film production company based in Los Angeles. He executive produces Whitney. How many of you have seen Whitney here? Yes? Yay. And if you haven't, it's on NBC Wednesdays at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. All right. And then um, our respondent is Kenyatta Cheese, a technologist, content creator, and entrepreneur, best known for co-creating the web series and internet meme database, Know Your Meme. So we're going to start with Quan. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good? Good? Daylight savings. Um, this has been so educational for me, first of all. So I want to thank all the speakers that have preceded uh, me in talking about engagement, authenticity, the role of networks, the role of storytelling, which is sort of where I come from. I mean, I'm, I have been working in the television business for about 15 years. I started as an executive and have moved into being a producer and a storyteller. And uh, I've, you know, the reason I got into the business in the very beginning was because, as an Asian American, I didn't see people look like me on TV. And I remember specifically. I was living in Washington, D.C., and I walked by uh, a newsstand, and I saw a picture of Margaret Cho on the cover of Then A Magazine, and I thought to myself, oh, they're letting us in? Oh, I can actually do this? So I started pursuing a career in entertainment a long time ago, and it's an incredibly fulfilling business because we're able to communicate every day with millions and millions of people in what we do. Now, we aren't communicating as much because all of you, or a lot of you, are also not on just on TV, but on the internet, and we're talking about that. So I, I wanted to sort of find out initially sort of where Asian Americans are, and you know, are they still watching TV? And I just want to give you some, some stats to talk about it, some context, and then I want to get into sort of a little bit of what I think is happening in this convergence between storytelling and, and the networks that, that Gary had talked about. Um, Nielsen which is sort of our god who we listen to all the time. We're like, what are the Nielsen ratings? What are the Nielsen ratings this week? They're a big company that sort of monitors television viewing. And in 2010, in November 2010, they did a report that sort of calculated, you know, the disaggregated, I think that's the right word, um, where ethnic minorities are in terms of television viewing. There's 115 uh, million households that have televisions right now in America. And 4% of that is Asian American. Now that's compared to 76% in white and about 12 and 13% with African American and Latinos. Now, so we're only a third of African American and Latinos and, you know, what, short of a 20th of white audiences in terms of our television viewing. That said, um, when we watch, oh, and the other thing about it that's really interesting too is that half of that, half of the households that watch television that are Asian American are in the Pacific Coast. Half. That's incredible to think about when you talk about the demographics of where they're at. Now the question is, when we watch television, what do we watch? You know, um, and I don't know, you know, they did, a, they did a survey of the top 10 shows among all the different ethnic groups. And of course, Latinos watch Univision and the telenovelas, but among African American and white and Asian audiences uh, charts, and I wish I had the chart to show you, but I'll tell you briefly, it's really interesting. What is the most dominant television show that most people watch? Does anyone have a guess? Jersey Shore, that's hilarious. <laughs> Well, the thing, the thing that most people watch, all t the, the one thing that is true about how, even though television has been dispersed, live sports is still the number one thing. So, of course, football, of course, usually takes the first five spots of mo what most people watch across all households. And then when you break it down, you go, okay, well, what else do Asian, among Asian American households will they watch? Well, there are two shows. This is November 2010, remember. Modern Family and Glee. Two big shows, two big presences, and of course that makes sense, and it actually uh, corresponds to what white audiences watch too. But then there are two other shows that make up the Asian top 10 list that I was surprised to find out. And they are, anyone have a guess? Nope, not Top Chef. Anyone have a guess? It was um, Hawaii Five-0, not surprisingly, right, obviously, and Outsource which was a, can a show on NBC that has been thus canceled about you know, uh, an American going to India to, to work. So there are, a a there are Asian Americans in those four shows I talked about, if you count Lily the Baby on Modern Family, <laughs> um, if you count that, but we are watching ourselves on TV. So um, they changed her recently too, so I, you know, I think she's still Asian, right? Yeah, they did change her. Uh, but um, the interesting thing is, but. In general, we watch less TV 
than our counterparts. As you guys all know, we're online a lot. And the, the stats are, are interesting. We're on uh, the internet 80 hours. I think that's a week. We download about 3,600 pages. This is what I got from this Nielsen thing a month. And we're th basically three and a half times more than any other ethnic group. And we share. And, and while we're on YouTube more, and we watch Wong Fu and we love it, we actually do YouTube more than we do Facebook. Like whites actually Facebook a lot more than Asians who share video and such through YouTube. So what does this all mean for me as a producer of television? Now, I produce a show called Whitney, and it's on NBC on Thursday nights. And uh, I just want to share with you a little bit of how we caught the, how the show came about, because I think it's a really interesting story about authenticity and engagement and storytelling. Whitney Cummings is a stand-up comedian. Thank you. Five minutes elapsed. And she came to me, and she basically said, I want to do a show that speaks to my generation to a generation of young people that are looking at the world and going, you know, is marriage a successful institution anymore? And it's really interesting because you look at the stats, like 70%, 72% of adults in 1960 were ma are married. Today or three years ago, it's 51%. And I think by the next census count, it's gonna go lower. Conversely, the number of people that are living together happily has risen from like 12% from 1980 to like 40% in uh, recent times. So we were trying to figure out how to speak to a show, do a show that was going to speak to an audience that was reflective of where America is changing. Because I think television has an incredible ability to communicate and, and reflect and, 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 and share what it is that um, we're experiencing. So you know, it was a little bit of that. And it was a little bit of wanting to be authentic to her voice. And w I'll tell you a quick story. When we first came out with the show, there was a lot of people going, oh, it's a sitcom. And we, we actually had some really, really negative reviews from feminists who felt like she was not a feminist. She was sort of taking the clock back and, and, and making a show about women that, you know, um, because the pilot had her dress up in a sexy nurse outfit and try to woo her man. There was a little bit of that controversy about it. And it was really reflected in Twitter, in Facebook, in all the things that we talked about. And, and we felt it. So we had to sort of shift our focus. And that was never our intention. Our intention was never to do that kind of a show, but it ended up being that way because that's how people experienced it. And it was really interesting to have that immediate engagement with the audience. And so we changed it. And actually, by the end of the season, we just finished, you know, the reviews online and the sort of bloggers started recognizing how over the course of 22 episodes, we were able to kind of deepen and extend that story beyond just what seemed at first a woman who, you know, didn't want to get married and, you know, was a man hater and, you know, actually it, by the end of the season people were writing about how much more complicated this character was and it was a richer portrayal of a woman who was part of a generation that saw marriage fail, that was part of a generation that um, was afraid of commitment because didn't want, we always said in the show that, you know, it, it's a story about a woman who um, uh, doesn't want to get married but is learning how to be a wife which is a really interesting idea that sort of juxtaposes those two things. So um, the internet can be a very, very powerful tool in terms of how I do my business. Because these days, I watch an episode, uh, I watch it on air. After we do an episode, it airs online. I follow the Twitter pages, the Twitter reactions to the episode in that moment. And I get exactly what works and what doesn't work. And I also sort of get to see people talk about what they're projecting onto the show which is really interesting, which is about like, you know, there's a, people, people are pitching, quite honestly, what they think should happen. And whether we want to take that to that place or not, it's a choice of ours as creators. But we can have that dialogue, which is really cool. So I think some of the things that are going on between this next, th this combination of the two things is great. I think television is in a unique place because it is not a YouTube video which is five minutes and comes out sort of, you know, periodically and whatever. And it's not a film, which is a one-time experience. It is a collective, hopefully seven years, if you can get to syndication, experience or five years that allows you to really change culture in a big way. And that's a lot, par large part why I, I personally wanted to get into it, because I wanted to, 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 to talk about changing culture through this medium as an, a medium as innocuous as a half hour comedy. Because you can imbue in it really interesting ideas and watch characters grow over time. Um, I, I don't know who earlier was talking about sort of the emotional, I think it was Aunt, Aunt Anna? Thank you. Um, who was talking about this sort of emotional connection you have with a character, right? When you can achieve that in this television form, you're able to then, people will write about it, people will uh, talk about it, and it's almost like they're a member of your family, and then you, and, and that's how I think ultimately you can monetize it. So the question is how do, 
as Asian Americans, if we're, if we're not, if the access to those things are not as easy, how do we go about starting to do that within our own sort of forms that we're creating? And I think part of the challenge right now is to sort of mature and grow and develop sort of what we start in terms of the internet. Because I look at a lot of the internet stuff now, which is great and, which is great and is out there, but you know, it doesn't stick. And I, I remember, I mean, this is an analogy I'll use and help, hopefully it'll explain what I'm talking about, which is like, when I was a kid, I used to love, love Great Bubble Yum. Remember that? Great Bubble Yum. You stick it in your mouth, you have that great pop of grape in your mouth, and it was great, and you chewed it, and then the flavor died, and you passed on. And you, you don't need to go back there, because you know that there's another, you know, you can go to the store next week and buy another piece of gum. And I feel like that's a little bit, for me, of how I view the internet. The, the people that are doing it, the content creators are, are great, but it's not consistent enough, and, and, and it has to, you know, and it, it's not yet developing an emotional connection. I think a lot of it is because it's personality driven. I mean, we're creating stars on the internet. Ryan, Kevin, these are great guys, and, there's, and what they're doing on the internet is incredible, but they're not yet contextualizing a story that's gonna make me fall in love. In the way that, you know, I think the best of television has to offer makes people feel that way. Breaking Bad, Mad Men, My Latest Obsession, Downton Abbey, which is sort of, you know, you can see how all of those things people talk about and retweet and reconnect with again and again and again. In fact, I just saw a, 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 a YouTube thing where they, they made a rap video to my uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air by way of Downton Abbey. It was pretty badass. Um, but anyway, that's sort of, I, I think we need to challenge ourselves to sort of be good storytellers online and, and really kind of dig in to what makes something resonant in the way that when we, when I and Whitney Cummings sat down to talk about what can make this show interesting? What, what can make this show really sticky and make, you know, certain people out there, women, men, who are in these kinds of relationships go, oh my God, that's me. That's what I, that's my life. You know, because I think that's how we can evolve the, the process and grow. And I think authenticity and engagement is so important. I mean, er, you know, I, I work on a sitcom. It is probably the oldest form of comedy. There's a lot of people out there that say, oh, it's dated form. They say, oh, it's a laugh track. It's actually not a laugh track. There's actually real people listening to it. And when we go to edit the show, we often have to tune down the laughs because we don't want the viewing experience at home to be different from the viewing experience when you're on set. Um, and on, on the tape nights that we tape the show, you know, we want to be authentic. And, you know, and it's every choice that we make in doing the show is about authentic. I'm going to do a little, for, I don't know, how many of you actually watch the show? Few people? Yeah, Asians don't watch TV. Um, and, there, you know, and we don't have enough Asians on the show, though we have one. We have a, an Indian actor named Malik Panchali who's amazing on the show. And, you know, we, we are trying to constantly be authentic, and in, in, even in the way we cast. It's a fictionalized show. You know, Whitney casts her, a friend of hers, Chris D'Elia, who is a stand-up, to be her boyfriend. And that kind of chemistry that you develop between two people that are actually real can't be replicated. I mean, a lot of times, in a film, I think you can kind of do a one, you can suspend disbelief, but in a television show that exists over five years, hopefully, that relationship, you have to believe to be true. And, and I think that, you know, that's part of what we're trying to do on the internet as well as on television. And there is a relationship that is going on right now. And I think we've, you know, we certainly as television producers are looking at the internet to sort of be our focus groups and our guide and all that such. But I think that also we can use the internet hopefully and grow those voices there and develop those stories deeper and better so that it is about something. Because at the end of the day, that's what moves me about television, and it and you know it is about something, you know, and the best of television. When you look at All in the Family or uh, Roseanne or any of the greatest sort of comedies, seemingly innocuous as they are, Cosby Show, they were about something, and it moves culture and changes culture in ways that are political, uh, and that's sort of what I get excited about every day when I go to work. So thank you so much for inviting me.